Sorry to interrupt, we're from Sky News in the UK. Oh, you really are? You're not kidding? No, no. I think <laughs> It was almost $400 for a full cart. I consider myself fiscally conservative yet socially liberal. I've never voted before because I don't know politics. He's one of the new Bucks County voters. I'm ready to make the change. I vote for the person generally. Are you better off than you were four years ago? We need to make sure our economy works for everyone. Hello and welcome to USA 2024 on the road. I'm James Matthews in Washington, D.C. And I'm Mark Stone, also in Washington. And I'm Dominic Wankorn in Pennsylvania, the town of Carlisle on the way to Pittsburgh. Welcome to the podcast, Dom. Glad to have you with us. Good to be here. Three days and counting, of course, until America votes. The polls, you hardly need me to remind you, are very tight. Poll trackers have just one point in it. Yeah, we've said it many, many times, uh, and we'll say it again, that this election will come down to just a few thousand votes. In 2020, 43,000 voters in Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. That's just 0.03 of the votes cast nationwide gave it to Joe Biden. He won by a whisker. Quite literally, every vote counts. That's why both sides are throwing the kitchen sink at the swing states in the hope of hitting those last few undecided voters. Of the so-called blue wall battleground states of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan, Pennsylvania is the biggest prize, with 19 electoral college votes. Harris is scheduled to do five events in that state on Monday alone. And Dom, so are you, yeah? Yes, exactly. Well, we're in Pennsylvania. We're sort of tracking across from the Atlantic to uh, Lake Erie, halfway across now. And Pennsylvania was part of that blue wall, but uh, Donald Trump managed to put a pretty big crack in that blue wall in 2016, getting uh, a victory here by less than 1%. Biden was able to get it back four years later by a very similarly uh, narrow uh, margin, but it, it is now split right down the middle. So with all the intense campaigning going on here, we set out to find a true rarity, an undecided voter. Does that still exist in Pennsylvania? So much talk, isn't there, about so much of the vote being locked in? Well, it's the holy grail, isn't it, for the campaigns to find those voters who have not made up their minds yet. And they reckon somewhere between sort of one and three percent of voters are in that sort of boat. We did find a couple in the Blue Dog Bar in Montgomery County. Sorry to interrupt, we're from Sky News in the UK. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you really are? You're not kidding? (laughs) (laughs) Am am I decided with who I'm going to vote for? Yes. Can we ask who? Yes, I'm going to vote for Trump. Have you always been Republican? No, I'm not affiliation. I don't belong to a political party. I don't believe in the two-party political system. I like to think for myself and not be pigeonholed. Fair enough. And have you voted Democrat in the past? I have. And it's uh, very depressing to see Trump out there lying. And I'm a registered Republican. So I'm ready to make the change. I vote for the person generally. Um, I've never voted before because I don't know politics. She's one of the new Bucks County voters. She's had enough. She registered. registered. So you've never voted before? No. But this time around you are going to vote? I think so. And have you decided who for? (laughs) No. So you're one of those rare swing voters. Can you say which way you might be swinging? Um, I'm probably going to swing with my husband. (laughs) Hey, you lucky dog. (laughs) (laughs) So there are still people making out their minds here in Pennsylvania. But I think what we found was just as interesting in a place called Bethlehem, which is only the seventh largest city in Pennsylvania, But it is very indicative of why this state uh, has become such an important swing state. It's a place where the Democrats could rely on uh, union-organised votes for so long, giving them the support here that they needed. But as economically things have changed here, they have politically as well. And and you could get a real sense of everything being up for grabs in Bethlehem in, in Pennsylvania. Very interesting town. It was a huge steel city. It made 80% of the steel for Manhattan skyscrapers. Many of the American Navy's battleships and the entire San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge steel, apart from the cables, were made there as well. It's a real manufacturing town, proper blue collar. Yes, well, it was certainly five miles of uh, forges and furnaces. That closed down in the early 2000s. 
the town has kind of reinvented itself now and recovered somewhat economically and now that site that massive steel site is the venue for guided tours of mills to tourists by former plant workers anything we call iron today is less pure than steel when you talk about iron so the problem well what was really interesting was our tour guide a guy called don young he's 87 uh, he has been a steel worker all his life until he retired and he was there with his wife, Barbara, who was on the tour for the first time. And on certain days, he comes and helps with uh, chores. And uh, then I wonder, well, who's going to help me with my chores at home? <laughs> clearly, they have a very happy marriage. She was clearly very proud of him. And she was uh, encouraging him to tell stories that he told her at home during the tour. Although they are very close, it seems, politically, they could not be further apart uh, because one of them, Barbara, sees Donald Trump as effectively the saviour of America, the man who's going to secure the country's future. And Don, her husband, sees him effectively as, as the next Adolf Hitler. It struck me that this is the place that made America great, put the backbone into America. Absolutely. And you've got a man now who says he's going to make America great again. Do you believe him, Don? No, I do not believe him. My wife does. Why do you not believe him? Because I've seen the rise of dictators in history. As I, as I am a studier of the history of industry, I'm also a studier of the history of politics and world politics. And, you know, Mr. Trump's campaign literally, literally mirrors that of Adolf Hitler. And he's been called that. He's been called a fascist. And I think they're quite correct to tell him that. I absolutely do not agree with that. And I'm sorry to hear my husband say this. President Trump reminds me of my own father. He was very strict and he was very tough and he told you what he thought, whether it was not nice, whether it was good or bad, and he kept his promises. I don't want to see people coming over our border who are, we, we have no idea who's walking in our door. We've had women murdered and raped by illegal immigrants. Who wants that? Who wants their children dead as a result of fentanyl, which comes over the border? At least with Donna and Barbara, they're open about their political differences. And I don't think that's the way for all households. The Democrats have been running an advert voiced by Julia Roberts, reminding women that their vote is confidential and they don't need to tell the husband, which caused an absolute stink from conservative commentators saying, if you go into the voting booth and vote a different way to your husband, it's effectively the same as uh, adultery. Did you make the right choice? Sure did, honey. Remember, what happens in the booth stays in the booth. Vote Harris Waltz. We are at that point where we're being told women apparently feel the need to hide their votes. We're actually seeing women to women notes. That's what they're calling them in female bathrooms and gyms with the message, your husband stroke wife, partner stroke family can't see or control your vote. It reminded me, you know, of quite a few months ago now. I was down in Georgia and we were at a rodeo uh, in a quite a rural, very Trumpy part of, of Georgia. And 99% of the people there were, on the face of it, Republicans and voting for Trump. But the guy who was running the rodeo, he said, look, I don't really talk about it much here, but, but I am a Democrat. And then he looked around. It's the first time I'd really thought of it like this. But he looked around. He said, look at all these women here. I reckon a good proportion of them will vote for Kamala Harris. They just won't tell their husbands. And I thought that was very interesting. And as, as this campaign has gone on, that idea has stuck. Which is interesting is it because, you know, last time round, there was the shy Trump voter. Things seem to have sort of flipped. And the question is, can the pollsters keep up with that kind of clandestine voting intention? So many questions. The key question, Dom, of course, is Don and Barbara, in whom we are all invested now. Uh, you asked them straight, can their marriage survive a Trump victory? What's it like being in a marriage where one of you thinks Trump is the future the other one thinks he's Hitler. <laughs> I, I just have to um, ignore and turn my back and realize that we each have our own choices to make in life. I'm not responsible for what my husband says or does, and I know in my heart what I believe. That can't be changed. I just know President Trump is going to be our next president. Well, that's a prospect, definitely. I, 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 I greatly fear that President Trump will become our next president. I live with it. I live with her. I mean, I, under, I understand where she's coming from and why, because I understand her. I mean, I, I, 
just because she likes President Trump, she is not downgraded in my opinion at all. I still love her. She's a very good woman, a good wife. But she has, there's an expression, drunk the Kool-Aid, you know. And can your marriage survive a Trump victory? Certainly. Do you think so, Barbara? I think so. Probably so. I'm j I mean, I just have this pain in my heart thinking that my husband's going to cancel out my vote for President Trump. So I, there's nothing I can do about it. We all have our own choices. I guess uh, that's democracy. Yes. That's democracy, democracy, yes. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much. It was, you know, it was, a, it was a difficult moment, clearly. They don't talk about politics at home, but they were prepared to talk about politics in front of the camera. When he started talking about Trump being Hitler and following a fascist playbook, Barbara literally sort of clasped her chest uh, and gasped for air. She was, I think, really shocked by what her husband was saying. You really got the sense that this is something they didn't talk about because they knew there was such division within their own relationship on, on this issue. And I, I do think that, you know, I covered 2016 out here, 2020 as well. Anxiety levels were high then, but I think it's on a completely different level now on both sides. And I think that's because both sides have been convinced that so much is at stake, that the whole future of this country is at stake. And they do take it very personally. Fascinating stuff, Dom. Uh, from you, Don and Barbara, you know what they say, never get involved in a domestic unless you're a journalist and the future of the free world is on the line. <laughs> anyway, let's pause it there. When we're back, Mark, you are talking economy and taking us out for tacos, right? Exactly. Tacos, uh, some mocktails uh, in North Carolina. The economy is, according to the polls, the number one issue for voters. But I really wanted to try and get under the skin of, of the perceptions and the reality. Welcome back to USA 2024 on the road. As we've been traveling up and down the country in the last few months, no matter what we're talking to people about, one topic keeps coming up again and again. Gas prices are going up, food prices going up, electricity, water, everything's going up except salary. Runaway inflation has caused problems the likes of which we never thought possible. He is going to go back to the economy that he was running before and it's going to help me save money every We need to grow our middle class and make sure our economy works for everyone. Gas was cheaper, my bills were cheaper, life was better under President Trump. That phrase, it's the economy stupid, a famous line from Jim Carville. He was Bill Clinton's advisor. That was the 1992 election. And Mark, you've been road testing it this time round. Yes, uh, in North Carolina. Why North Carolina? Well, well, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. But my motivation uh, for the story was, as you say, to find out the extent to which um, it really is the economy that is driving voters to vote. The polls suggest that it is the economy, that that is more important an issue than immigration, just, uh, more important maybe even than the character of the two candidates. And if that's the case, well, it could be really very problematic for Kamala Harris. Listen to what Ronald Reagan said back in 1980 as he ran for the White House. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? Is there more or less unemployment in the country than there was four years ago? So the answer to that question America, for most Americans then was no, I'm worse off. And so they ditched Jimmy Carter and they went for Reagan and the rest, as they say, uh, is history. Now, Gallup, the pollster, has been polling that same question to people this year. Uh, and it's really interesting. 52% of those asked said they are worse off now than they were four years ago. That certainly suggests a desire for change. I'm interested in your choice of North Carolina, battleground state, of course. It is an intriguing place politically, more so since Harris took over from Biden, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's always been a tight state. Trump won it four years ago uh, by just 1.3% statewide. You need to go back to Obama in 2008 for the last time. The Democrats won North Carolina. Biden, when he was the candidate, the Democrats were, were kind of concerned. They, they thought, there's little chance of us, us winning it. But interestingly, and I've been talking to Democratic 
strategists this past week who were focusing specifically on North Carolina. Since Harris took over, they really feel like it's back in play, shifting demographics, a larger African-American community, a growing urban, suburban population, all give Harris a very good chance there. And of course, why is it so important? Well, 16 electoral college votes, a win here really helps propel either candidate to that magic number 270 to get to the White House. So we went to Kannapolis, which really feels like America's suburbia, middle class, leafy, it's just to the northeast of Charlotte, uh, in the center of, of North Carolina. Now, back in 2020, Donald Trump won this town's district by just nine votes. So it's precisely the sort of county that the Republicans need to hold on to uh, and the Democrats need to swing. And we chose three businesses at random on one street. First stop was the Sabor Latin Grill. Uh, and customer Riley Mullery. She was 23, uh, a babysitter uh, in between jobs. I think it's Whistler. And behind the counter was William Pascali, 18 years old and voting for the first time. Is that all right? Yeah. What's the most important issue for you? Um, I would say income taxes and the open border. And you talk about uh, income tax. The economy is a big, a big concern for you? Oh yeah, 100%, as I do live by myself. Right now, I mean, I got my house a year ago at 1300 and it's just been every inflation, everything going up. I mean, groceries. I went to the store the other day and got a full cart. Usually that costs $150, if that. It was almost $400 for a full cart of just regular household needs from like toilet paper to laundry detergent, paper towels, things like that. So I hope that that can be solved as well. Because, I mean, it's hard living out here when you're still getting paid what people say is minimum wage, trying to live off of that and live by yourself, you know. And even people that don't live by themselves are still struggling, so. What do you do? Can I ask what you do? I actually don't have a job right now. I lost my job about a month ago, so oh, babysitting is my thing. Babysitting. That's a full-time job. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you get the right ones, yeah. this one's, him's a handful, huh? All of these unemployment rates are way higher than they were before, and it's just, it's getting worse and worse. And so, what does that mean in terms of your vote? Does that mean you, how, how will you vote? Are you happy to tell us? Happily. I'm voting under the Trump administration because um, from the last time when my grandparents voted for Trump, everything economical was fine. There was no wars in the Middle East. There was nothing. Everything was fine. And I think that the Trump administration will do us right again, get us back on the right track like we were already going before the Biden administration took over. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you know, all that talk about good news on inflation, unemployment, they are vague notions, I suppose, to people who care more about the 20-odd percent rise in prices since COVID. It is, uh, and that is because, d despite the fact that the Biden administration have done a remarkable job in turning around the economy uh, over the past four years, they've come at it from it being in a very, very bad place thanks to COVID. But right now, uh, unemployment is coming down nationally quite quickly. Inflation is down. The problem is it's taking a long time for people to feel that. I remember talking to a um, political strategist about eight, nine months ago now. Biden was the candidate, feels like a million years ago. Uh, and he said to me that November is too soon for people to feel like an improving economy is actually improving their lives. And, and I think that's precisely where we are now. I think the other problem, of course, is that the prices aren't going to actually come down. Inflation might get lower, but that means that the, the rate of price increases is going to slow. And I think many Americans believe they have a kind of God-given right to cheap produce, cheap groceries and cheap gas. So it's going to be a long time before they notice that slowdown in the prices not going up quite as fast as they were in the past. And also, I think, you know, having spoken to a few people here, there was a restaurant owner in, in uh, Bethlehem where we've just left. You know, I said that actually uh, today, petrol prices have come down to the lowest they've been for a long time. And he said, yeah, I just don't really believe that. I think there's a huge amount of skepticism about official statistics, isn't there? And it's all about what you're feeling in your daily life. And at the moment, they're not feeling it's getting any better, too many of them at least.
Yeah, and I've heard more than a number of people telling me that the uh, Biden administration has been tweaking the numbers over the course of the past few months to make it look as though things are better when actually they're not. And to get a better sense of that, we, we headed two doors down from the taco bar to a bar uh, where I met David Deal, uh, something of a tycoon in this town, four businesses. Uh, one of them he's already spun off as a local franchise. Uh, and the conversation here with him was really interesting because I found him to be in a bit of a bind. Um, we've been open at this particular location we're in for about a month now and uh, actually in a steady increase. But the fact that you are opening a new business suggests that the economy can't be too bad. Yes, one could definitely say that. We're, we're hopeful. Um, I think that's what we all try to be. But what are the issues that, uh, that concern you the most? Honestly, you know, like labor is a big issue. It's one of our largest expenses as a business here. Um, the increasing minimum wage, you know, uh, is it an expense as a business owner, but also a benefit to, you know, our staff that is, that we can't do this without. But you've seen that uh, prices are going up, you know, things are expensive. Things are expensive and things have been expensive since COVID. Um, there are still certain items that are at very high points, but generally um, I feel like our typical staple items have become a little more controllable recently, a little more stable, uh, not quite as high as they were uh, during COVID, but some have returned to a little more pre-COVID uh, levels on that. But it feels that certainly the perception, and I don't know if you get this with your staff and, and your customers, that people still feel like things are very expensive, even if sure, prices I, are coming down a bit. All that anyone has to do is go to the grocery store, you know, like um, compare it in a five year, a 10 year, a 20 year, you, your, your number has doubled within the last year. You can see advantages of both sides. Sure, there's always advantages of both sides. I consider myself fiscally conservative. I'm a small business owner. Um, how business principles and laws are applied uh, mean a lot to me. And, you know, whether I'm able to put a roof over my head as a business owner. And then on the flip side, you know, a lot of times those politics are aligned with certain groups that are less socially liberal. So consider myself fiscally conservative yet socially liberal. I want people to do what makes them happy. And that provides you with a conundrum though? It certainly does. It certainly does and I, I don't think I'm alone in the US on those terms by any means. So from there we headed down the street to Decadence Popcorn uh, owned by Dwayne Jackson and his wife. It's a little saltier because of Cajun. You can smell the popcorn outside. I, I admit we did eat quite a lot of popcorn, but we had a great chat with Duane as well, who gave us a, a very different perspective. It's like every election year, there's going to be some anxiety. Every election year, there's going to be people that are a little more reluctant to, to loosen up the pocket change. And then come January, we're back to normal. And is, is the economy one of the big issues for you in this election? Yes. For any one of the candidates to get our vote, we, we focus on anybody that's got small business in there in their plan. Anybody that's going to de decrease the, the taxes for small businesses, anybody that's going to be a little more reluctant to let the small guy pay the vast majority of everything has my vote. There's a sense in this town that we felt that, that a lot of people are, are hurting economically, that they're, they're finding life a struggle, whether it be their groceries or small business owners, and, and they're looking for change. And for that change, they're, they're looking to Trump. Well, a lot of the small businesses don't understand tariffs. Whoever's getting stuff from any of the countries that he's putting that 200% tariff on, you're going to be hurting a little more than what you think by that tariff. So a lot of small businesses here who, who will rely on stuff from outside of America, from China or, or wherever, who will suddenly find things are a lot more expensive. Yes. Yes. I wonder why people aren't hearing that here, though. I can't, speak, I can't speak for everybody, but a lot of people are basing their opinion on gimmicks. If you don't listen to what a person is saying and actually dissect what a person is saying, you're going to be gimmicked until the nonsense that's going on, the name calling, race relation things that's going on. You're going to focus more on that and, 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 and not focus as much on what's actually is being said. Trump's core message like is America first. And on the economy, that means bringing manufacturing back home, popular, 
populist, uh, you know, in places like Bethlehem, where Dom has been, the idea of reopening those steel mills would be uh, very popular. But but how achievable is it really uh, in a modern interdependent world, especially for an America that post-World War II has been all about free global trade? In his last presidency, Trump tariffed uh, goods coming from China heavily, but he extended it as well to the EU, Mexico, Canada, and it was a large part of his America First policy, all about uh, making foreign countries pay their fair share for doing business uh, in America. And did they? Well, no, not really. Um, <laughs> tariffs are, are very often paid for by American companies who hand that cost down to the customers. But Dwayne's point is plenty of other things come from places like China, the bags, the, cu- the containers that he uses, um, and many other shops uh, around the town, he said, uh, would be hit really hard. Gift shops and, and the rest of it, who have um, a lot of stuff that comes from China, they would feel the impact of the tariffs very fast. And Mark, what's Trump's policy now? Well, it's almost exactly the same, but but supersized. More tariffs, uh, up to 200%, more tax cuts. Uh, he's selling himself very aggressively on business. Uh, and this time, he, he seems to be taking it to the max. Harris blames corporations for, for keeping the prices high. Trump blames Biden, uh, and for many, Biden equals Harris. And we won't know whether that equation computes until election day. Yep, I can't wait for it to all be done, and we'll find out. (laughs) (laughs) You, You and me both. Anyway, on that note, uh, that's it for today. Thanks very much, Dom. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for joining us on the road in the US 2024 election. See you tomorrow.